have you thought about sending an email to Spotify, Clayton, and just like just taking a flyer to to Spotify and just see like, hey, you know, they're buying everything in the podcast sphere. Would you buy Alien Familiar Podcast Company for like five million bucks? Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar RPG Podcast. I am Clayton. I'm Jordan. And I'm Elliot. Before we get started, you can find show notes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash alienfamiliar. And if you would like to help us out with supporting the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash alienfamiliarmedia. So if you enjoy our content and would like to help us out with hosting costs, any help you would be able to give us would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for joining us. Um, today we are talking about Dungeons and Dragons, and specifically we are talking about how hard D and D should be. And we're also going to be talking about other games, but for this topic, we're going to be focusing mostly on D and D. Whenever I come up with a topic idea, or we come up with a topic idea, I like to do some research about what um, what other people have said in on the internet about a particular topic, and. I was shocked by just the dearth of articles of podcasts about this very topic. And the reason why I'm so surprised by it is because it's been something that I've been struggling with ever since I started DMing. How hard do you make the game? How hard is fun? What do you guys think? I think that's like the, the one of the like dirty little secrets about D&D in general. Uh, some games just don't make any bones about uh, it should be hard or it should be easy, and they just kind of come right out with it. With D&D, it's such so murky. Uh, it's difficult to even gauge whether it, you know, what is hard, quote unquote, that I think that a lot of people just kind of choose to pretend uh, they just kind of wing it and don't really think about it. Yeah, I think a lot of DMs are just kind of like taking the temperature of the room. If they think about it at all, like, it, I guess for plenty of dms it's just like well this is what i wrote and this is what you're gonna fight and put up with and whatever um but for those that are even more responsive it's like oh there's a lot of fucking shit going on here maybe i should cut a few hit points off of these guys they're they're struggling elliot you've said as much yeah i mean one I, we, I guess we also need to take into consideration that a lot of people are you know a lot of people running their modules too so if you're uh if you're the type of if you're the type of player or dm that just kind of has always lived out of a, a pre-written module. It's not really something that you kind of have to take ownership of. Even if you do end up making changes along the way, you 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 get you get the pleasure to blame someone else. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we before we get too deep into um, how like how to make how hard the game should be, um, I want to make a distinction that there's basically two different axes that you can. At, well, at two axes I I came up with for how hard a game should be. The first axis is like how hard it is to learn and to play the actual nitty gritty of the game itself, and then the other axis is all of the fluff. How hard should that be? How hard should the plot line be? How hard should the the story? How hard should the world be on the characters? Um, that, per that second part is something that I, I saw absolutely no discussion of online. So mm -hmm. I, I would really like to spend the bulk of this episode talking about that, but I definitely want to go into, um, how hard it is, how hard it should be to play, learn and, um, do the game mechanics, um, just to kind of get a baseline. Um, I think that for me, it's, um, the factors for making the game hard to learn and play. Um, a lot of it is just the complexity and the amount of rules that are in it. Um, crunchy games tend to be harder to learn, but not necessarily. Um, I, I've played a couple of supposedly rules light -like games that really took a lot for me to wrap my mind around how to actually play it like Apocalypse World games, Apocalypse Engine games. Um, I had to read the core rulebook for uh, Dungeon World a couple of times before it, it really got to me how to play the game. I'm out. I'm out on that one. 
Like, if I have to read your book more than once to completely understand it, I'm probably not going to play your game. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, you can't, you can never completely, like, you know, get a game on the first go. Uh, and, and it's almost impossible to really, if, I mean, at least for me, uh, I'm a, I'm okay with winging it and getting the sketch of it. Uh, but it's been a long time since I've been a brand new gamer, so what were you going to say, Jordan? I was going to say the, the Apocalypse World, the Powered by the Apocalypse games, um, I think are a good representation of uh, how a lot of newer systems try to handle that question of difficulty um, for the player by explicitly giving rules for what the in that game's terminology is the MC um, is allowed to do the, the D and D doesn't, you know Um, like in, in D and D they've had the the challenge rating system for a long time. And that's supposed to be like guidelines for what, you know, a reasonable um, difficult encounter an easy encounter, you know, um, the player characters, uh, X number of player characters of X level would have to, you know, expend whatever percentage of their resources to get through it, yada, yada. Um, In uh, Apocalypse World, there's like whole rule systems about what the the narrator, the game master, can do. Um, So that's that's an interesting approach, but I think that um, rules like systems like that are kind of uh, pulling a sleight of hand on you there, because like you're talking about... um, where they they don't explicitly spell out, you know, here's all these tables, here's, you know, all these rules for every circumstance. They're basically just offloading that onto the game master to decide on the fly. And, you know, it's it's not like the game is less complex because they didn't bother to write it down. They just didn't bother to go into rules to describe all these particular situations. You know what I mean? You know, to get... Uh, I... I agree with Clayton. I think it's more fun to talk about the the what the DM does with the the game once you have it and have the rules. But to just uh, but to get back to that first part, I, I mean, I'm pretty. I have a pretty set opinion on this when it comes to D and D specifically, since we're kind of using that to frame the talk. Uh, I, I mean, I really think D and D needs to be as as easy to acquire as possible with that, while allowing the game to stay fun. I mean, you know, D and D's kind of chained a little bit because you know, th- being the originator, you know, anybody who played it when they were a kid that comes back to it or wants to get their kids into it or whatever, you know, they expect to see strength decks, con, int, whiz. They expect to have skills and proficiencies and and all that stuff, but. Beyond that, I think that they've done, you know, I think they've done a pretty good job, you know, making it the flagship role-playing game. Uh, it's it's not, it doesn't solve all problems. It doesn't uh, it doesn't make rules for everything. Which you know, like you were saying, Jordan, you know, any game that you know that's kind of what you got to the needle you got to thread, right? Is like if you either make a rule for everything, which is so difficult to, you know then learn every minutia and every subsystem and every sub game in the rule book or you leave it too much up to your dm and it just kind of ends up being this on the fly you know uh, kind of like unfair i mean the more you leave up to a dm on the in the moment the less consistent the game's going to feel the more arbitrary it's going to feel and then that becomes unfun for me as a player but you know i think D- i think dnd's done a pretty decent job is of maintaining their brand Making sure that whenever you open up uh, the new, you know, fifth edition, it looks like D and D, but still making it, you know, I like they have, it, they, I like the the basic rule set. You know, you can learn to play D and D if you just buy the intro, you know, module and start basic kit. I, I mean, how long? How big is that rule book? Maybe fifteen pages at the most. And I mean, I think that ninety percent of the game that you need to play is in that. So. You know, I think D and D should be easy. It should be geared towards, uh, you know, easy to learn for most people. And uh, but I mean, me personally, I've been playing all these years, and I still play it. So you know, it's it, it satisfies me. So I think they've done a pretty good job with it. I think it should be easy. Yeah, and the designers of Fifth Edition, like, well, going back to even Third Edition, 
they did a very good job of of it, at the very least having a consistent core mechanic and that goes a long way for determining whether or not the game is easy to learn or not um where d where third edition up through fifth edition it's you roll a d20 you add certain modifiers to it and the re- and then you check the result against um what the difficulty you've got to roll in fifth edition i want to say that the it's assumed that for an average for a typical roll it's going to be approximately a 50 percent success rate um i want to say in third edition it was a the success rate was supposed to be a little bit lower but um I, that kind of goes into whether or not the game is mechanically harder or not as to whether whenever you roll the dice it's going to be more likely that you're going to get the um, the positive or the rewarding result um, I feel like that games that are that are harder not necessarily harder to learn but the games that are in and of themselves harder to play are the ones where it's failure is more likely than than success and um i don't know if i dis- if i agree with that clayton i i think that there's more of a range for complicated games but i think that for the people that um grab a hold of those systems and pull it apart and figure out how to optimize those kind of complicated games can be easier as far as accomplishing what your character wants to do than games that are more simplistic to learn and has everyone you know in this like very small mathematical space or everything's very like uh, you know bubble wrapped like that's the way that a lot of those rules like games mean to feel like to me but like if you just get into a really complicated game without knowing what you're doing yet you'll probably die your ass off does that make sense like there's more of a reward for getting into the complexity i I mean you know i i I love that point you made clayton because it's not really something that dawns on me too much but um now that once you said it it was like a light bulb went on i think that other games like world of darkness and the old vampire games having a core mechanic not quite the same but you know it's all going to be a d10 I think that whole game is D10s, and it's just a matter of figuring out how many you roll. You know, those kinds of games go a long way. Uh, if you can pin down a, a core mechanic, any game that's done that, you know, on like versus, I guess, what would be the good opposite example, old school D&D, where, you know, <laughs> no two rules or no, no two actions were alike uh, in how you got that answer. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, any game, I think, that starts with a core mechanic, which... What games break that mold? See, I don't play too much outside of D and D for a long time. Uh, what games can you, can you guys give a good example of a game that breaks that mold and goes outside of the the core mechanic idea? The only games that come to my mind are older games, like games that probably came out in the '90s or before, like the original World of Darkness. The number you needed to roll in order to get a success was all over the place. Um, in second edition and before D and D. You were often rolling a d20, but it changed what you were... Sometimes you were trying to roll low, or sometimes you were trying to roll under a number in order to succeed. Sometimes you were trying to roll over a number to, in order to succeed. And the how you calculated your um, your success rate, or the, the success number that you needed to roll, um, I don't know if I ever learned that there was some sort of secret math behind all of the numbers that were there, the numbers always just seemed to be arbitrary as to what you were needed to uh, get in order to succeed on something. You can still see... Do you think that D&D... Excuse me, but I was just going to ask, Jordan, what do you think... I'm curious to know, what do you think D&D should be as far as difficulty curve? Because I know you're probably our most critical uh, player, at least in my game, of the system itself. As far as difficulty to to pick up or difficulty to succeed in the game? Um, both. Well, I've said a bunch of times before, I'd like to see a more complex game. Um, I like to see more options for what you can do that aren't required, but are good for players that, like me, that want to get into the, you know, nitty-gritty stuff. Um, I also think that, um, the game balance of 5th edition is very childish in my mind it's it's made to be a a game where the player characters after you know third or fourth level are 
almost always going to win um, un unless something like really goes wrong, like really, really bad. Um, like I, I hate how hard it is for individual characters to die. Um, and yeah, it just, it drags the game out a whole lot. And, um, you know, I know that on, on one level, you know, people are like, well, you, you're, you're invested in this character that you made and people won't be having fun if their favorite characters are just dropping like flies or whatever. But when you've got a character that's just a stack of hit points that turn because of what that necessitates combat to be your experience with that character winds up just being hours and hours of rolling dice and you know doing damage back and forth and you actually don't get to spend that much time in that character's skin interacting and you know doing other stuff it you know you've you've preserved the character their longevity but the quality of time that you are spending with that character is in my opinion opinion diminished and i love combat don't get me wrong but you know if you're thinking about it as you know what is it about this character that you love um you know combat is is not the top thing on my list when it comes to stuff like that does that make sense yeah yeah i don't think i've ever played a character who i i think back on fondly and think oh man wasn't it awesome whenever I was able to do that X, Y, and Z game mechanic and uh, I was just really effective at combat? I never think back on, on characters and view them like that. I always think about the character's personality and what they what they were about and what they were wanting in the world, not like just how they spell, slung their, swung their sword or slung their spells. Yeah, I think that's a good way to get to i think the meat of this topic then um because like what basically what you guys both described in a lot of ways is just outside the rules i mean you could not even have a game you could you, know, you kind of not to uh not to use this term in a disparaging way like it always kind of has been when i was a kid uh but like larping the larping side you know what i think what draws a lot of people to the larp scene is the it's the narrative it's the it's it's the uh in character stuff and and that doesn't even i mean that usually most of that stuff's outside of the system am, am i wrong in that i'm not trying to say that at all i think that having a an objective quantified challenge that you run a risk of of failing and is sometimes a long shot to succeed i think that that is absolutely essential to enjoying what you're doing otherwise you're just sitting around collaboratively writing a story together and that's not the same kind of dopamine hit that you get from succeeding at a game um all i meant and i love combat and clayton i i don't mean to say that i don't think back fondly on characters i've had that you know were really fun to play mechanically in combat scenarios i definitely do what i meant by that observation is just that uh, such a huge percentage of your time is spent in the combat loop in D and D um, that that is a, it's an overrepresentation of, of the, the actual emphasis that you have on your character, the actual value that you get out of it. Um, it's, it's outsized. Um, yeah. I think that skill checks, you know um, like long-term out of game stuff that requires mechanical things, you know, interacting with uh, NPCs, persuading or deception or whatever, um, you know, interrogation stuff like there's all kinds of challenging shit that involves dice that is not just slugging away hit points off of somebody. And I think those things are a lot to do with, like, how you express who your character is through the game mechanic and, you know, get something out of that that challenge. I think I understand a little bit better what you mean now. I, I get it now. Like that time that you uh, turned the bad guy into a turtle with polymorph, that kind of stuff. I didn't do so, that. You did that. I, I, yeah, yeah, I know. That's the the usually the that's one of the highlights of my gaming career. That's one of the most fun moments I've ever had, and it was outside of combat. I do agree that I don't know if there's a system that really because you know so much of combat when you when you drop into combat in any game, I mean you're really at the whim of you know each other. You know, I think that. A very streamlined game, the combat turns can bog down, you know, if the players, you know, are not engaged, say. 
Um, or if the battle gets complicated with lots of NPCs and things, or if your DM, you know, is kind of slow, like me at times, uh, managing the board. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I do think that, uh, that that's usually whenever I... I know that when with Straw, that we got to a point where it seemed like every session was overcoming a big bad guy. And I even in particular remember, I think you guys maybe even got a little quietly frustrated with me because... I think we were on, it was uh, one of the last sessions before you guys went into Ravenloft. I threw a very difficult encounter at you guys just because in my mind I was like, well, I mean, it should. there's not really a combat encounter in this little scene. And, you know, I, I kind of was looking to eat up some time and it turned out, turned out to be a really like rough battle and everybody, it kind of almost spoiled the, the mood a bit because we spent most of the session in that combat. Um, but something that occurred to me whenever you were talking, Jordan, was, you know, when you're building a game as a, on the DM side, at least taking Strahd as, as my example was, like, you're going to fight Strahd. I mean, when you buy and say, I'm going to run Ravenloft, the ultimate goal is not, it, I mean, it's, I guess it's optional, but it's not really optional. Like, you're going to, it's all going to lead a pretty straight and narrow path ultimately to Strahd. Um, you know, I guess what a question I want to ask is, is that kind of linear direction, like you may not know in which angle you're going to approach the game or approach going to that singular plot point, but you know you're going to go to that singular plot point. Is that good design, bad design, or neither? I, well, for for most games, for most of the games you're going to play, most of the storylines, it, it is very useful to have, to let the player characters know what their target is, what the um, what the trajectory of the game is going to be. Um, in some of the games where I've been playing that really haven't had a, a main storyline that have been just kind of the player characters existing in the world and exploring the world and doing things in the world, um, I've seen that there is th that lack of focus of having a particular goal um, does tend to run down the game, kind of saps um, enthusiasm. So, like having having something that the player care, players know that they are working toward definitely gives that um, sense of sense of purpose and sense of direction for the game. Yeah, player characters um, are really bad at staying self motivated, in my experience, and you want to like have some obvious goals. Um, to dangle in front of them so that they they feel like they're accomplishing stuff, and I think that that probably goes back to that difference between you know collaborative storytelling and uh, you know playing an actual game that because the stimuli is coming externally, um, it feels earned in a way that it might not have if it was self generated, because um, you could set you know easy goals to accomplish for yourself and. You know, it's not going to be as rewarding as attaining something that just appeared in in the world. Does that make sense? Yeah, I I think this is a great transition to kind of just talking about hard games and the storyline that that's hard to play. Uh, we've kind of already started talking about where um, if you don't have a a set storyline, it's going to be harder to play through. Like like Jordan, you said the the players have a hard time maintaining us um, maintaining their self motivation that can make the game hard. Um, not knowing what you're going to do um, leads to frustration on the player's part. Cause what do you mean? I can do anything. Um, I, I, I'm getting analysis paralysis. I don't know what to do because I'm afraid I might do the wrong thing. Hmm. This is a very, useful topic for me to have right now because where we are stepping into the second half of the campaign um where i'm going from a module to i'm trying to write my own story from here on out um you know that's really that's a that's a much more difficult when you're writing it yourself or whenever you're trying kind of planning it out yourself that's hard um it's hard to really dial in on either a singular idea that you want to play out um but also a, a, on the player side of it for me though I definitely chafe under a uh, overly linear storyline. You know, when I when I I mean I understand that the DM has to make plans 
and the DM has to have a sense of where the game's going to go so that they can just put their arms around the task of running the game and making encounters and things. But on the other hand, you know, uh, I really enjoy a game that puts participation, I guess, not necessarily optional, but like gives me some gives me some agency. I think that as a player, at the very least, I really enjoy agency. I, I like to feel like m my participation in the uh, in the world is not necessarily forced or compelled. I mean, because I mean, frankly, there's only so many ways that you can you know defeat the evil god from destroying the world. I mean, there's only so mm -hmm. many there's only so many times that you can collect the artifacts that will save the world before uh uh before me as a player i'm i'm thinking like no i don't want to go into the next quest i want to go back to that town and i want to burn down that innkeeper who was a douchebag to me or <laughs> you know no i want to you know no i don't want to give up this you know artifact to the good god that's trying to save the world because maybe i want to be a god you know, like, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. It, and I, I think that's really selfish as a player uh, on my part. But at the same time, I think that the games that are the best that I've ever had, I didn't feel compelled to participate. I felt the urgency. And that's really difficult to pull off in a game, especially if you're making it yourself. I mean, have you guys had that experience? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for Definitely. sure. The the hardest version of that for me, and it's because this is probably what I've almost exclusively run over the last couple of years, is in post-apocalyptic scenarios where it's literally what Clayton just described. That, you know, the world is fucked up. There's probably not any innkeeper to go back and have issue with. There's probably not even a fucking town. Um, you know, everything is just burnt out and horrible, and the few people that you find are more likely than not to be, you know, potential combatants. And so like, you know, with that bleak of a setting, um, you pretty much can't do the evil God, you know, gather the artifacts kind of story. You have to do something else. And I don't know, I've, I've tried it a couple different ways and, uh, it's, that's one of those things where you really have to rely on player motivation to, to self-generate a lot of content you can set up some things but um and i guess this is another kind of difficulty to get into is that when you get into more realistic games they tend to be more lethal um so then there's there's a lot more skin in the game as far as like what what they stand to lose and it's not as clear as what the as far as what they stand to gain by putting themselves out there and i think that players um since, uh, at least instinctually, if not um, directly, that when you volunteer something as a goal to your DM, I want to do X, Y, Z, I want to set up a farm and have a family, you know, um, that makes you vulnerable to the first time the DM has, you know, a week he didn't prepare and wants to grab some adventure hooks, like, okay, the orcs come and burn down your house and, you know, kill your family. You know what I mean? Like, you're just fodder for story at that point. Um, and I remember you guys, I think this was before I was uh, participating, but you guys had a really great conversation about how much backstory uh, somebody should bring into a game. And, like, I always worry myself, and I find myself as a DM, when I get these big, long spiels uh, about, I mean, I like character background, don't get me wrong. Uh, the more that a player gives me... Um, a, it just shows me enthusiasm for a game that gives me kind of the, the gusto to like, yeah, this is cool. People are enjoying it. But on the other hand, you know, when you get a background that's very much, uh, I want to do this long term. And it's almost like when a player sets their own, um, when a player sets their own long term goal, um, you're kind of putting yourself in at odds with your DM. So, you know, it's, it's, it's. Sometimes it's, I don't know, I guess I guess the point I'm trying to make is that uh, as a DM, it's difficult to work in character background and also pursue your own storyline, and, and they're sometimes in tension with each other. Yeah, absolutely, because the player is doesn't have any outside knowledge besides what is on their own head as to what's going on in the world. And for the game master coming at it, if you've got an idea... The player care the player's ideas may against 
what your pre what your preconception of what the game is going to be. So it's it can be very difficult to kind of change your if you choose to change the um the direction and the the feel of the game to be to work that uh, character's background into the story. To to pull this a little bit back closer to the the topic, um, I, one thing that we haven't touched on yet the, is the the connection between how hard it is to succeed or survive in a game due to say the the game mechanics and the balance of it or whatever versus the story itself like how how much harder it becomes on a dm you know if a a player character that you had intended to you know live through their story arc at least um you know suddenly drops dead because of a stray bullet or whatever the fuck might have happened um or player characters randomly decide to kill someone you know things like that um there's there's a lot of difficulty presented to the dm um when a game system makes things like dramatic swings like that possible that i don't think exist um in D D as much when you know the villain could just teleport away or whatever um you know what i mean yeah, the hardest thing for a DM is to allow your character, your player characters to do things on their own. That That's what introduces the hardest elements of being a game master. You know, and the post-apocalyptic thing really does fall victim to um, this. It, I think they're really hard to run. Before I played this game, um, or I ran the game we're in now, I, I ran a uh, World of Darkness version of uh, a post-apocalyptic game. And, I mean, it's always just about survival. And uh, at least in, in that game, I found uh, it kind of difficult to to get the play. Once you go, I mean, it started off just like, let's figure out a way to survive. And then eventually, you know, you transition to a place of safety. But by the time that you've, you know, they found, like, safety and they want to go pursue other heroic goals, they've been, like, focused so much on survival that they don't want to take any risks, you know what I mean? I had a hard time getting my players to even want to, like, venture out and do anything that was even slightly risky because, you know, by their nature, even those games are pretty deadly. So, you know, they they were like, I don't know, I don't want to. No, I don't think I do want to go save that other town because the last time we did that, two people died. And I think we're just going to hang out here, and uh, and I'll, uh, the game didn't last much longer after that. It got to that point. Yeah, that, in that particular genre, um, it's making the game hard like that, making all the cho- like make, making the hard choices that players have to make and live with the consequences. Those types of games are designed to be more like that, and you're expected to have to make difficult choices where maybe there isn't a totally good option you're just making uh, choices of choosing the lesser of multiple evils Um, those types of games are very hard as players to play they are very taxing mentally um, on on making those decisions and living through the consequences of those decisions and i think that that those are the types of things that make a, the story part of a game very, very hard. Um, other types of games are maybe a little lighter on that, but that that's kind of what I was wanting to talk about with, with um, how hard a game should be. Because I've seen a, a lot of variation in the years that I've been playing as to what different DMs think is an appropriate amount even within one genre, ignoring all the other genres that exist. Yeah, let's talk about player death, because I think that the, the, those two things are intimately wrapped up together. When you're talking about how, quote-unquote, hard, say, an encounter should be, or uh, or a, uh, the steps that you walk your players through to accomplish, say, a dungeon or whatever, you know, it all hinges on, well, just how hard are these guys to die? Because as a DM... In 5th edition, I know I, I try to skew towards the deadlier side when I'm building my encounters, frankly, just because I don't buy it. You know, whenever, I mean, if I go online and I look up an encounter and it says that it's quote-unquote deadly, well, I mean, I know that I've 
I mean, I'm just like everybody else. I've fudged my dice rolls in the past. I've deep, I've taken away hit points. I've added things in the past. But most of the games, most of the encounters that we've played in my game, um, have been straight up. And uh, and frankly, you know, uh, if you're if 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 you're trying to get across to your players that you as a DM are willing to kill them. I think it's important for a player to know that they're not so sacred that they have nothing to lose. Because I've played in those games before where you just sat down at the table knowing, he's not going to kill me. I can do whatever the hell I want to do. I don't have to run away from any encounter. You know, I mean, this guy spent all day building this big fancy map. I ain't going <laughs> to lose this. You know, and uh, I think that when you get to that point, uh, then combat is even worse to suffer through because... I mean, then, so, yeah, but in D&D, it does make death very difficult, and, you know, honestly, in my experience, it's been like, you, you, you can either total party kill, or you can, or, you're, or, I mean, or you're just kind of deciding how long you want to spend. It's like how, you know, then it, it's not really, uh, so anyway, what are your guys' thoughts? Well, I would just like to add that um, I don't think death is the only metric for making the game hard. I think it is so much harder to play a character who has um, made a decision and that decision has had bad consequences, like living with the result of a, of a bad choice and the fallout from it is so much harder on a player than having their character die. Oh, that's such a good point. I, I, that's something I struggle with in games. Uh, I live so much on the board, and I think of difficulty in terms of walking from difficult encounter to difficult encounter. Sometimes I'm bad about making plans like that for players, contingencies where I'm not necessarily giving them a battle, that, that a monster to defeat. I'm giving them a crossroads. Uh, that's a good point, Clayton. The the point that I, like immediately jumped in my mind of, of an example was back whenever Jordan and I just met you and we were playing Apocalyptia and um, Larry's character got bit on the leg and we had to make the decision whether or not to amputate his leg because he got bit by a zombie. And mm -hmm. we ended up we ended up doing that and the rest of the game his character was without a foot. Yep. <laughs> and that, and, <laughs> and that was that was first session, first encounter with the undead. Yep, I remember that. <laughs> I had a, sim yeah. had a similar thing happen in uh, in that in that World of Darkness game. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a good point. I'm trying to think of examples in my games or in my playing experience where, uh, yeah, I think that as a game maker, you know, you get you fall so much in love with the the story that you're trying to tell. Sometimes, and, and we've talked about it even here before that like. You know, when you're when you're planning a dungeon or an encounter and the players just don't want to seem to go, you know, you just kind of like detach that encounter from the world and maybe instead of that being over there, now it's over here. So, you know, a lot of what a DM does is like coaxing, you know, the party into walking down their path. Sometimes we forget that like it's okay if they just choose not to go. Like write a contingency. Like if the players are supposed to go stop a you know, some random bad guy from completing a ritual over there. Well, if the players aren't biting on it, then let him do the damn ritual. And like, oh no, the undead horde now is in the world and it's your fault. Mm -hmm. I I just want to um, say with regard to that, that Larry situation, that's a pretty good example, I think, of where, um, where game rules directly affect what is possible in the space of the narrative. And I, I don't think that that gets enough attention that there's a lot of, um, that there's this assumption that doesn't ever pan out in real life. And that is that with whatever game that you're playing, um, well, it can go whichever way you, the DM wants and, you know, whatever, like you're free to just tell whatever kind of story, but if that had been a Dungeons and Dragons game and we didn't have location hit points and we had a shitload of hit points and, uh, you know, he had taken a couple hit points from a zombie bite, it would have been very contrived to have put that same situation together. And I don't think it would have held the same kind of like narrative weight and like ob objectivity to it 
um, that it did because of how the the structure of that game rule that game's rules worked. And so I think there's like, yeah, it, you're right, Clayton, when you said initially that there are two different dimensions that these things move on: the game rule complexity and the the difficulty. But I don't think that they're you know perpendicular to each other. There's there's a lot of connections along the way between those two aspects of it. Yeah, and D and D, if you want to lose a limb, you pretty much have to choose to do that as a player. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't get a Jamie Lannister like character defining moment in D and D. I mean, it, 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 yeah, I mean, yeah, D and D isn't just it's just not made to do that. Um, and I don't know that that's always bad. Like, it comes to my mind a situation we had in my game where, you know, uh, y your character made a split decision to put another party member in danger, and that was completely narrative because by the book there's literally no way that your character could actually like I think the exact situation was you put your sword to the neck of another party member and held them ransom uh, mm -hmm. from a bad guy. And I struggle with that as a DM because it's like he has no, I mean, this has no teeth. Like, mm -hmm. What's, you know, I mean, and, and, and in some ways that's okay. I mean, cause if I'm the player on the other end of the sword, you know, do I really want my other players to be able to just like knife me in the back and I die? Like, you know, I, I like that it's, in some ways, D&D &D kind of checks uh, some of your worst instincts as a, as a, as a murder hobo type player. But on the other hand, like, like we were saying, it just, it does lack a depth um, that makes, it kind of puts a lot on the GM, right? I mean, because if you're going to try to introduce those crossroads or those, those, like losing a limb or, uh, or uh, those complications of ha maybe just getting severely wounded or having a, a long-term flaw added to your player for whatever reason, like madness. I know there are rules in the DM's guide, but they pale in comparison to other systems. Those types of things, um, you end up just having to ride them yourself as a, a GM, and worst case scenario, you're making that shit up on the fly, and, and that's whenever you lose, at least as a player, that's when you're going to lose me. I completely disagree that that's a check on a player character's darker impulses. I think it's, in fact, exactly the opposite, that you have so many hit points, you can get away with a bunch of stupid bullshit that you would not have even tried if you were a more realistically vulnerable kind of person. And I've seen this play out so many times, comparing what the same player characters, or what the, what the same players do week in and week out in a D&D &D game versus, say, an Apocalyptia game or, you know, something else lethal. Um, when it is possible for someone to just knife you because of some shit you pulled, you're not going to pull that shit. But when you know, oh, I'm the big deck 10th level hero, you're going to do whatever the fuck you want because you know you can kill 90% of the town. I, I think that vulnerability breeds caution. That's true. And that's... There's there's a certain amount of etiquette that comes out of that. Would you agree, yeah. Clayton? Yeah, I've I've got a very similar situation that, um, or not similar situation, but a, an example of that. Yeah, that D and D is definitely doesn't curb that. Um, back several years ago, I had a group, and one of the characters in that group would just attack a party member whenever they were getting frustrated they would do like a like a sword attack whenever they were frustrated with what the character was doing that was mm -hmm. their method of um keeping the other player characters as in line they would attack them and there they was there was no consequence outside of just losing a few hit points until i decided okay you've done this enough times that um your your character is no like no longer pings as good. Your character now pings as evil when the detect evil spell is cast. And that fucking pissed that player off. I will tell you. Um I haven't I haven't had a player get so pissed off at me except as as what that character what that player did whenever I told him his character was evil for constantly attacking his party members. <laughs> I mean, but I mean I mean what else is that? Well, he mm -hmm. wasn't, he wasn't doing lethal, I, he was, he was doing regular damage, he was doing lethal damage, um, type, but he wasn't doing it to kill them, so it, he was, he didn't feel like that was a justified thing that 
I should force an alignment shift on him. <laughs> I mean, so unless we'll we re- just I mean, stab somebody with a pencil. I mean, in D and D, that they've they've nerfed those rules too, where ping, being pinged whenever you do a detect evil, I guess, is the worst out result, I guess, of of a, an alignment shift anymore. That doesn't really. Any, I mean, the alignment system in D&D has gotten so watered down, there's really not a hell of a lot of consequences to them, I guess. I guess spells, like you were saying, are about, about it. Yeah, there's some magic items that will only attune to certain alignments and mm. whatever. Ooh, that's, that. that's, oh, that'd be, ooh, that'd be nasty. If you have, like, a, a, a character with a really nice weapon that's attuned to good and you should make him go neutral or evil. <laughs> mm-hmm. I get so there's, pissed. There's powerful ones on both sides, though, so... Well, hmm. you know, if, I will say, you know, we're running a long-term game and talking to you guys on this podcast, uh, you know, being stuck in D&D, I, I think I've even said this before, like, I have learned that there's virtues in short games and long games. Like, I, I'm looking forward to uh, kicking it off my bucket list to uh, uh, to have ran a, a long-term game, but... Uh, I gotta say, the more I run D and D, the more I look forward to running something else. <laughs> uh, for some of these very points, it's and it's just a flavor thing. I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, if you go back into any game, there are going to be things you're like, "Gosh, I think D and D does this a lot better," or, or whatever. But um, uh, you know, some of these uh, difficulty in general. I want to play a highly lethal game. Um, uh, what? what uh, how do you guys think that highly? You know lethal games do they make uh, how does that affect how the players behave uh, in terms of pursuing their uh, goals lethal games or games where you can get seriously scarred or maimed um, I think they are inherently harder to play just because you know that you are constantly on that that razor's edge where a bullet can end you and that that's a lot of pressure um, you are definitely a lot more methodical about the game and about the situations that you get into. You're going to be avoiding combat um, as much as possible. You are going to make sure that any combats you get into are as absolutely one-sided on your side as you can possibly make them. I think that it makes the game harder, but I also think that it makes the players a lot more cautious and a lot more thoughtful about what exactly they are going to be doing. Do you think that lends itself to shorter arcs as the DM, or do you do you think it's possible to run a conventional, quote-unquote, campaign um, in that kind of a world? Clayton, how long was that Factions game I ran? Uh, do you remember? It was I a while. Used, yeah, it was more than six months. Yeah. Weekly play. Yeah. It's definitely possible, Um I lost some player characters in there, like people died. Um, and so you got to like make sure that that's, um, you know, taken into account in whatever story that you're writing. You don't want anything to hinge on one particular person being there for it necessarily. Um, but that game was a ton of planning and a ton of intrigue. Everybody was in a post-apocalyptic town and they all had their faction within the town of various sizes and you know some had a few resources that other ones didn't and you know they were strong in different ways and weak in others and um everybody kind of had their plans people were making npcs that they cared about um one one of the players retired their player character and started playing one of their npcs after a certain point it was really dynamic it was a lot of like um a lot of diplomacy stuff, a lot of blustering and threats and, but fairly light on combat. When combat did happen, it was a ton of prep before, um, whenever possible. I I think they got ambushed a couple of times, but, um, more often than not, you know, it was, uh, something that they strategized about at length. Yeah. I mean, for me, combat, like that's, that, that scares the shit out of me as a DM, to be quite honest with you. Like in a game where I can't rely on combat to eat up 50% of the time in your session. I mean, cause we play pretty short games. I mean, like my sessions are only three, maybe four hours on a good night. And yet, you know, just when you have a game that incentivizes avoiding combat, there's so much 
well, they're just so it puts a lot uh, in the hands of the players to, and that can be hard on the GM. You know, if you kind of have to know the world, you have to have a lot of I'm trying to struggle to describe it. But like you know, you have to have the ability to play off the characters, and the system has to enable you to be able to answer questions on the fly. It's like, well, what's in that house over there? Or, you know, you know what I mean. Like if you're trying to run from the bad guys, they may the players may hide in a place and they're expecting content and you're just as the dm you're just making it up on the go that's a that's a tough thing to 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 do as a gm in my opinion it's it's uh it's usually why i don't run those types of games very much because i just find that really hard why do you think half of apocalyptia is random tables (laughs) yeah that's exactly what i saw it's it's incredibly taxing on especially the game master but it's also very difficult it's it's a very hard game on the players when you know you don't have combat to uh fall back on as something to sink time into just throw in a combat whenever you need to bridge some time or you need to pad out the rest of the session if you know you can't do that it's 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 i mean it's physically exhausting um those sessions are the most like i get done with a session like that and it is the most tired of after a game that i ever am is whenever i've run three or four hours without a combat um there's there's nothing as exhausting as that but there's also nothing as rewarding as that in my opinion yeah for sure probably the Those longest are the best ones probably the longest combat i remember in an apocalyptic game was uh clayton were you there for the session where um this wasn't factions. This was another random uh, game that I was running, but uh, Kyle was in it, and um, I guess I won't say the other player's name because he hasn't been on the show. But um, they got pinned down by a sniper, and uh, I, I think it was the other player that got nailed pretty good, and Kyle was like trying to hang on to him, and he's like bleeding out and stuff. But they're like stuck behind a car and as soon as they go to move anywhere they start taking shots from the sniper and they were just like way out in the open except for that one spot of cover were you there for that no i i do not think i was there i do not remember that that was like in game um i want to say we probably spent like an hour or more um just them trying to work out what to do in this one situation and for a it must have been just like the two of them. Maybe there was somebody else there, but for a group that small and for it to to take up that much time, uh, it's kind of a stretch to call that a combat because I probably rolled an attack roll maybe, I don't know, six or seven times for that entire period. But as soon as they'd walk out, they'd start taking fire and they'd you know, immediately duck back to wherever they were trying to go and they'd coming up with all these different ways to try to distract them and stuff like that. Like it was really cool, but you know, that was, uh, that was one of the weirder combat encounters that I've ever ran. So I'm trying to, we've kind of, we've traveled this, uh, this road, uh, so far, but I'm still trying to figure out, have we answered the question? How difficult should a game be? It's specifically D and D how hard should D and D be? Uh, I I think that for how hard it should be, um, I something that I did in my early years as a game master, and I have seen replicated by pretty much everybody who has taken up the DM's mantle and started DMing. It, there's a very definite learning curve to it. Um, is that there's this mentality that the player characters need to constantly be taxed. They need to be constantly pressed upon. They're, every encounter needs to be a little bit harder than the last one. I think a lot of this comes from video games because in video games, you are basically learning the skill of playing the game and each subsequent encounter is supposed to build on that skill and make it a little bit harder. But I don't think tabletop role-playing games have that same arc. There's only a certain amount of skill that comes with rolling dice. Um, There's only so, like, as if you're ignoring player creativity, there's only so good, there's there's only so, um, you can only get so good at a role-playing game. 
And there is a mentality that I used to have. I, I'm trying to get myself out of it because I still see some little remnants of it. But I also see a lot of new DMs doing it also where they're, they've constantly got their thumb on the scale to make things a little bit harder on the player characters. And that is very taxing or that's very that's very hard on the player characters to see that everything that they are facing is this very difficult struggle every if they if they aren't defeated then every victory is a pyrrhic victory where they it cost as much to win as if they would have lost um it takes every resource to take um to win i think that there can be you can play D and D in very hard mode, where it is where it's basically mentally punishing for the players to to succeed in the game. I, I, I'm definitely on that, you know, on that side of the scale myself. Uh, maybe that just comes from you know games where I just feel bored whenever I don't feel like there's any chance of of being. Uh, defeated but at the same time you know i'm also bad about thinking always in terms of combat so you know i mean there's nothing more rewarding than you know you know leveling a, a D D character and then just getting to be awesome like there that there are moments where that's really i think that's just important combat wise but also out of combat wise i think that the transition we're making now in the game in my game i'm trying to do that a little bit in the uh, downtime sessions, like establish the fact that you guys are a force to be reckoned with, respected, you know, powerful people just in influence and in just ability. And I think that it's important for a character that as they've invested in a game over time, they need to have those affirming moments where it's like, no, I'm a big damn hero. Like, yeah, I, I, I got this. You know what I mean? I'm going to, I'm going to do this crazy thing and it's going to succeed because I'm a hero. Um, so I think that I, I tend to uh, I tend to make uh, often make things uh, try to make things a little more difficult than I, than probably they need to be from time to time. Yeah, it has to to mean something when something is easy or hard, and if if it's always getting harder, that's predictable and boring, and you know that's that's not how you have fun. It you have to you have to have variance to keep people's attention and. Um, Especially as you get higher level, I mean, it stands to reason more things should become easy, not not more things become difficult. Like the you relative to everything else in the world, you're getting more and more powerful than more and more things that exist in the world. Um, so when a real challenge does come along, that should be narratively important. That should communicate something um, to everyone about you know the weight of whatever this creature or NPC or whatever it is um, that you're facing or whatever you know challenge it, it again it may not be combat it may be you know some particular lock or some particular persuasion role or whatever the, the thing is um, but yeah you, you should be succeeding more the more powerful you get that's obvious <laughs> that's what you've been working for right yeah right. You, yeah you don't feel like a master thief when um, every single lock you come across um, there's a very good chance that you are not going to be able to pick it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, to bring in the video game analogy, I know that we talk about it, but the open world games, like I'm playing a lot of Skyrim right now, I mean, that's reflected. I mean, there, uh, you know, I'm playing a thief right now, and I remember, uh, you know, I remember whenever, uh, you know, you'd have to just, oh, it's a, I don't know, what is it, adept lock. Uh, okay, I can't do those. I know I'm not even going to try. I'm not going to break the picks. Now it's just there's there's a special satisfaction whenever, you know, you're, you you stroll up to a master lock and you're like i got this and then you do or if you just you like click on an, a, a basic lock and it just immediately opens you know yeah it's a payoff you've been fantasizing about through all the struggles and bullshit up to that point so um we're starting to get a little bit longer than what i would like to go for this episode I've, i still feel like we've got a few things we might want to talk about in the future maybe um, related to other like tie it in from other topics but still talking about how hard the game should be but um, I want to go ahead and start wrapping it up now. Um, Elliot, do you want to go first for Geek Things? Yeah, um, you know, there's a podcast I've been a long time listener to. Hopefully I haven't said it already. Um, the History of English podcast. Um, it's uh, made by a guy named Stephen, let me get it right, Stephen Stroud, I believe, or Straub. 
Um, he um, he's got a couple things out. If you, I actually bought uh, an audio book. I guess it's an audio book. It's something. It's like a basically. It's like he made a podcast that you can buy on iTunes called The History of the Alphabet, where he goes into excruciating detail and tells the exact history of every letter in the English alphabet. And his podcast just tells the history of where English comes from, um, where how it started in uh, proto uh, Indo European, and it. Everybody who's an English speaker grows up thinking, "Man, our language is so stupid. Why is our language so stupid? None of this. Why is it so difficult? Why is this grammar terrible?" Uh, but it kind of, when you listen to the podcast, it kind of turned that on its head for me because every little change, every little peculiarity about a language represents something that actually happened in time and to actually like explore those changes and how real world events actually change the the things we say and how we say them and ultimately how we even think it, it it's it's definitely been a, a nerd uh, a, a, a very uh, in enjoyable nerd uh, obsession I've been plunging into lately Jordan do you want to go next uh, yeah, there's a YouTube channel that I've been enjoying quite a bit lately. Um, it's called Game Maker's Toolkit. It's um, hosted by an Englishman named Mark Brown, and it's mostly video game centric. I think almost exclusively video game centric, but he's talking about um, game design decisions, and uh, you know, he talks about difficulty in games, and um, you know. Uh, skill acquisition and things like that, you know, character leveling, whatever. Um, lots of great topics. Um, the videos are, you know, fairly long form, um, you know, 15 to 30 minutes, I guess, something like that. Um, enough time to like, uh, really do a decent treatment of, uh, very specific topics in game design stuff. And he's got a few that are, you know, an hour or so long or longer than that, but, all very enjoyable, very high production value. Um, I think that it's uh, probably my new favorite YouTube channel, so give them a look. Game Maker's Toolkit. All right, um, my geek thing, um, it's really just one geek thing. Um, I've been, I've recently picked up the game Cities Skylines. Um, it, if you're not familiar, it's basically the um, the successor for, uh, for SimCity. It came out about five years ago, but that is not my geek thing. My geek thing is even more geeky than that. It is a YouTube series of a guy playing City Skyline, and the guy playing it is a city planner by profession. So it is a city planner plays city builders is the YouTube channel, and um, it I, I find it absolutely fascinating to watch and listen as he's explaining the real world applications and the theories behind city design as he is building these cities in this video game. Um, it's like Jordan, you said before the podcast, it's a very meta um, take on the whole thing. Um, and I just, I just love meta stuff. I, I want to clarify something. I said, it's Kevin Stroud and you can check out uh, the history of English podcast.com's his website. So sorry about that. I want to get that straight. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, what do you say? We stop this bullshit and start rolling some dice guys. Sounds good. Okay. This has been a production of Alien Familiar Media. You can find past episodes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. This production is protected under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivatives license. Music for this episode is Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale and can be found at freemusicarchive.org.